stepping down. Special counsel Robert Mueller makes his first public comments about his investigation into President Trump. Abortion battle. How the fight for the unborn is playing out on the state level. Keeping the Sabbath holy. The Archdiocese of Detroit launches a plan to make Sundays a day of rest. And it's the bomb. Pope Francis says the words of the Holy Spirit are like dynamite. We'll explain. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, May 29th, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. President Trump says case closed, Democrats promise their investigation will continue, and both sides are very quick today to react to special counsel Robert Mueller, who broke his silence for the first time since the start of the Russia investigation. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. Making his own clarifications, the special counsel goes on camera for the first time to personally turn the final page on his report. We are formally closing the special counsel's office, and as well, I'm resigning from the Department of Justice to return to private life. Special counsel Robert Mueller steps aside, but first goes in front of cameras to make a few of his final conclusions clear. There were multiple systematic efforts to interfere in our election. And that allegation deserves the attention of every American. Mueller says Russia's cyber attacks were designed to damage the candidacy of Hillary Clinton. Still, there was no coordination between Russia and the Trump campaign to win the election. There was insufficient evidence to charge a broader conspiracy. But did President Trump commit another crime? The Russia probe examined whether the president tried to obstruct the investigation itself. Today, Mueller is pointing back to his final report. If we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. Citing a Department of Justice policy guarding a sitting president from indictment, Mueller says charging the president with a crime was not even an option. But Congress does have its own authority. Democrats like Representative Jerry Nadler, who leads the House Judiciary Committee, say their investigation will go on. It falls to Congress to respond to the crimes lies and other wrongdoing of President Trump. We will do so. The White House says it's time to move on. President Trump tweets, nothing changes from the Mueller report. There is insufficient evidence and therefore in our country a person is innocent. The case is closed. Thank you. Press Secretary Sarah Sanders also responding to Mueller's remarks. He completed his investigation. Now he's closed his office and it's time for everybody to move on. He's going back to his uh, private life and we think everybody else should too. Now some top contenders for the White House see it differently. We are hearing from a number of Democratic presidential candidates who say Mueller's statement today was essentially a referral for Congress to begin impeachment proceedings. Warren. White House correspondent Mark Irons. Thank you, Mark. President Trump urges Roy Moore not to run for Senate next year in Alabama. The president says in part, I have nothing against Roy Moore and unlike many other Republican leaders, wanted him to win, but he didn't and probably won't. If Alabama does not elect a Republican to the Senate in 2020, many of the incredible gains that we have made during my presidency may be lost, including our pro-life victories. Illinois' House passes a sweeping bill to protect abortion. It says people have a fundamental right to make decisions about reproductive health. It would require insurance companies that cover pregnancy to cover abortion, but its neighboring state could soon be abortion free. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey tells us more. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. Abortion has been raging across the country, especially since the swings vote on this issue. Justice Anthony Kennedy retired, replaced by Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Now, Missouri could become the first state in the nation without an abortion clinic since this court decided Roe v. Wade. The governor of the Show Me State says Planned Parenthood still has until Friday to meet the state's requirements and get its license renewed. Planned Parenthood's president issues a warning. If our health center cannot provide abortion care, Missouri will go dark. And this will be the first time since Roe versus Wade that safe, legal abortion care will be inaccessible to people in an entire state. This is not a drill. This is not a warning. But it's an answer to four years of prayer 
for Students for Life's Reagan Barklage. This is huge news. And first of all, I'm just so grateful that the state of Missouri is holding Planned Parenthood accountable. This facility has had 80 calls for ambulances to this facility just since January 1st, 2009. The closure could come as the state investigates. State Health Department officials identified a series of deficiencies in a detailed letter to Planned Parenthood, which needed to be addressed prior to their license renewal. Missouri's only abortion clinic is in St. Louis. There is a clinic over the border in Belleville, Illinois, where the state's house yesterday approved a bill to protect abortion. Well, Illinois will join New York as one of the most extreme abortion-minded states in the country. Illinois will become a magnet for abortion uh, with women likely coming from across state lines into Illinois. And we expect uh, abortions to dramatically rise in the state. While next door in Missouri, activists couldn't stop a bill to ban abortions after eight weeks of pregnancy. Republican Governor Mike Parsons signed that two-month ban on Friday. And I believe in two months you can make a decision. I believe that, that that can be done. But in two months' time, I also believe that that child that's right. Now, the possible closure of Missouri's last abortion clinic is not a result of that law. That law, that ban, that two-month ban, does not go into effect until August. Now, over in Illinois, the House bill now moves on to the state Senate, and the Democratic Governor, J.B. Pritzker, says he looks forward to signing it. Lauren? Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi. Thank you, Jason. More than a dozen civilians were killed in an overnight airstrike in Syria. It's the latest in a string of deadly attacks by the government and Russian forces. Syria says it's trying to rid the country of rebels, but human rights advocates say the government is targeting schools, markets, and hospitals. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby has more from the State Department. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. State Department spokesperson Morgan Ortega says the U.S. is alarmed by the ongoing airstrikes in northwest Syria. She says the Russian and Syrian governments are recklessly escalating the conflict, forcing hundreds of thousands of Syrians to flee their homes, and adds the violence must end. Explosions rang out just before dawn in the last rebel stronghold in Syria. Rescue workers moved quickly to help the injured trapped under a collapsed house. The responders, known as the White Helmets, reported at least 15 people were killed in three villages. The violence is centered around Idlib, a province in northwest Syria. In the last month, fighting has been on the rise there and in surrounding areas. Syrian President Bashar Assad, who is backed by Russia, has ordered a wave of intense bombings. His goal is to destroy the rebels and end eight years of civil war. But humanitarian officials at the United Nations say the fighting has led to hundreds of deaths and hundreds of thousands displaced. In many areas of active hostilities, humanitarian operations have been suspended. Syria's representative says they are trying to wipe out the rebels, who they consider to be terrorists. He says they're connected to al-Qaeda and are using civilians as human shields. The UK's ambassador to the United Nations, Karen Pierce, says she doesn't trust the Syrian regime. She believes their military has targeted schools and hospitals. For the moment, we need to carry on making as much noise, if you like, as we can uh, to try and get the practice of targeting the civilians uh, changed. State Department officials agree. Morgan Ortega says the U.S. will continue to raise the alarm on the Assad regime. The secretary will continue to have ongoing discussions with his Russian counterparts. None of this is going to be solved overnight, but we are clearly take note of this. We're alarmed by it and we're going to call it out. And U.S. military presence in Syria continues to be debated in Congress. Many lawmakers from both parties have been concerned about President Trump's decision to withdraw all 2,000 American troops from the country. The president later agreed to leave a small U.S. presence there to keep the pressure on what's left of ISIS. Lauren. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reporting from the State Department. Thanks, Wyatt. Lawmakers in France pass a bill saying Notre Dame Cathedral must be rebuilt as it was before last month's devastating fire. The measure says the cathedral must be redone according to its last known visual state. Last month, that fire destroyed the roof and an iconic spire. Afterward, President Emmanuel Macron asked architects to submit ideas for what he called inventive reconstruction, and some included adding a rooftop garden and a pool. <laughs> Why is atheism on the rise around the world? Well, that's the subject of a Vatican conference. And this, the Vatican hosted 
the first culture of unbelief meeting 50 years ago. Now, researchers released this year's report saying three in five American unbelievers were brought up Christian. Professor Stephen Bullivan is one of the researchers and is a professor of theology and sociology at St. Mary's University in London, but he joins us from Rome. Stephen, why in your view does it seem that atheism appears to be chic or on the rise in society? I know you converted nine years ago and were an atheist. Yeah, no, I came the other way, which, you know, the <laughs> isn't the normal direction of travel in a lot of societies at the moment. You know, a lot of my recent research, separate to this project, has been looking at Catholic disaffiliation. And, you know, we see in Britain around 10 cradle Catholics uh, leaving for every, you know, one person who joins. And in America, it's around seven leave for every one who comes. So, I mean, this is, this is a big issue, and it's one the church really has to try and face up to and, and understand, understand the reasons and, well, and let's, see how we turn it around. Yeah, let's do that, because in your report, you write popular assumptions about convinced dogmatic atheists don't stand up to scrutiny. So are atheists actually true unbelievers? Yeah, well, some of them, uh, one of the things we see is, yes, you know, there's a, there's a group of atheists who you know were very convinced you know, kind of fit the stereotype if you like but but that isn't all of them and i think we probably know this if we talk to our friends talk to our family members talk to co-workers and you know especially in britain or america we all have them um you know these aren't these aren't the stereotype the kind of the new atheist um you know classic image of a of an atheist of an unbeliever um these exist and you meet a lot of them on facebook but you know that that isn't the the 20, 30, 40% of the population that, that we're seeing in, in many Western countries. Well, what is it? Is it the nuns? Is that what you mean? Well, well, I mean, the nuns are, you know, there's a, there's a big overlap. It's not complete, but, you know, a lot of nuns, you know, still say they believe in God, still, you know, or aren't sure what they believe. So we're talking people who either say they don't believe in God or who don't know whether there's a God or not. Um, so that's who we mean when we're talking about unbelievers in this report. Um, and and a, a large proportion of them are nons, but equally, you know, there's a good chunk of those who, who still tick one of the Christian boxes on surveys. Um, you know, we oh, know that there's a large proportion of, of Catholics, of, of Protestants, uh, who, who really don't believe very much, if at all. So let me ask you, we only have a, a little bit of time, but I know grandparents and parents Sure. want to know what to do when they see their children going that way and declaring themselves as atheists or even agnostics? Well, uh, there, I mean, the, you know, there's no one easy solution. I mean, we know, we know that parental influence, grandparental influence is the single biggest factor that, that there is in transmission. Um, so, you know, all that parents can do is to practice themselves, to believe themselves, to try and show and live the faith, not just Sunday to Sunday. I mean, it's not just about, you know, oh, we always took them to mass on a Sunday. It's about, it's about praying through the week. It's about praying at bedtime. It's about rosary. It's about making that a, a really lived reality. And, and it's becoming, as culture becomes further and further and, and less and less hospitable to this kind of, you know, robust Christian identity, this is kind of the Benedict option, then, then we need to, to either Find others yes. to make this seem okay. more normal or, right. you know, really try and try and pass it on as best we can. Thank you so much, Professor Stephen Bullivant of St. Mary's University Pleasure. in London. Coming up, analysis of a former priest secretary's allegations about church officials and defrocked Theodore McCarrick. The Vatican corrects a transcript of an interview yesterday between Pope Francis and a journalist from Mexico. It relates to the often asked question, when did the Pope know about sexual abuse allegations regarding defrocked Cardinal Theodore McCarrick? The correction made it clear that the Pope did not remember if in 2013 he had been told about allegations against him. The Vatican released transcript had made it sound as if Pope Francis denied knowing about it. And joining me now to break all of this down is Edward Condon, DC Bureau Chief for Catholic News Agency. Ed, welcome back. Nice to be here. First time that we are hearing from the Pope about this issue, Archbishop Vigano in August released a letter that basically said the Pope knew 
about these allegations because he told him <laughs> that, that, that he knew. And yesterday we heard from a former priest secretary who claimed that restrictions placed on McCarrick were not enforced. So what are we looking at here? It seems like at a minimum what's emerging is, an, is the, that McCarrick was playing the system? That's right. I think something that's um, that we have seen, this is the first time we've really seen the Pope address the issue of McCarrick at all and what he may or may not have been told at different times. Now, the Pope has said he doesn't remember what he may or may not have been told in 2013, and really only the Pope is able to tell what he remembers or not. But the release of these excerpts from supposed private correspondence of Archbishop McCarrick by one of his former secretaries does raise a lot of the old Vigano accusations again. But one thing that is emerging from people around Rome, especially the Congregation for Bishops, where um, this investigation into how McCarrick was able to survive and thrive in the Curia for so long that's come forward is that he was really very good at playing one hand against the other, that different Vatican departments, whether it be the Congregation for Bishops or the Secretary of State, would hear different things and say different things to so him. So they thought McCarrick was doing one thing, he might have been doing another, then he was going to China, then he was here, all of those different exactly. sorts of things. So for example, Cardinal Giovanni Battista Rey, who used to be the prefect for the Congregation for Bishops when McCarrick was still in ministry, or sorry, not when he was still in ministry, but when he was before he was defrocked um, and in retirement, clearly sent him a letter effectively turfing him out of where he was living in a seminary in retirement, ordering him out, saying no more public appearances. Now, McCarrick got that letter, but he seems to have been able to turn around and say, well, I need to move out, I need to keep a lower profile, Rome's asked me to do this and that, but then go to, for example, the Vatican Secretary of State and say, I can really only do discrete things. Perhaps I could go on a discrete I trip see. for you. So the, the point about really what we're, we're seeing here is, and I think it comes because we haven't seen this report. We have not seen the report from the Vatican about Cardinal, ex-Cardinal, Theodore McCarrick. But then the point comes, well, why? Why, why do we even need to see the report? And I know you have a good answer to this. Well, we need to see the report because until we really understand how McCarrick was able to get away with this for so long, we can't guarantee it won't happen again. Now, in terms of why we haven't seen it yet, there's, a lot, there's, there's really a lot of different reports that are being compiled. All the dioceses that McCarrick led have been forming their own assessment of all of the paperwork and letters he left behind, forwarding that to the Congregation for Bishops in Rome. <clears throat> Excuse me. They themselves have been coordinating with other Vatican departments, so they've got to collect all of these things and filter them in. Now, it's not clear where they are in that process. We do know, um, we've understood from sources inside the Congregation for Bishops, that the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. has finished its review, that they've sent their conclusions to Rome. Those are ready and waiting. And that's where Theodore McCarrick was uh, the leader here of the Archdiocese of Washington. That's right. This is where he, this was the largest Archdiocese he led, the most prominent position he enjoyed. It was what made him, what got him made a cardinal. Um, it is also, it's worth noting, not where allegations of sexual abuse against him tend to focus. That was more his time in Newark. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it really gives, I'm sure, a very good indication of whom he was speaking to in Rome, who knew what about him when, and who he was in communication with and what he said. So we still need to wait for the report as more people seem to come out saying what they say they think and that what they think they knew at the time. All right. Ed Condon, D.C. Bureau Chief for Catholic News Agency. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, why the Archdiocese of Detroit is canceling youth sports on Sundays. Ma grazie allo Spirito Santo, che la dinamis di Dio. Dinamis, okay, there's a hint. Pope Francis says the Holy Spirit turns human words into dynamite. At his weekly talk with pilgrims at the Vatican, the Holy Father says the Spirit is capable of tearing down walls of division and opening new paths for the faithful to find God. We've seen that here. In an effort to keep holy the Sabbath, the Archdiocese of Detroit brings an end to youth sporting events on Sundays. Archbishop Alan Vigneron writes in a pastoral note, in shifting away from the hustle of required sporting activities on Sunday, we will reclaim this holy day and create more time for families to choose activities that prioritize time spent with each other and our Lord. Joining me now is Father Stephen Pullis from the Archdiocese of Detroit. He's the director of the Archdiocese Department of Evangelization, Catechesis and Schools. Father, welcome to our broadcast. Thank you very much. You know, here in Washington, kids are so over-programmed, and I think that's the case across the country. The Archbishop Vigneron also wrote in this pastoral note that the cult of busyness is not of the Lord. In what ways do you and the Archdiocese hope that this new 
policy will restore balance? Well, we heard from so many families exactly what you're saying, that they feel like unless they're always doing, 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 that uh, they, they feel like they're doing something wrong. And so this is a chance to say, God made us to be together, not just to be always doing activities. And he's especially made Sunday as a day for a family to come and just be together. And so we hope that this pastoral note will be an opportunity for families to take time away from all the activities so they can just be a family together. You know, I remember when stores were closed on Sunday, I'm giving away my age, um, but young people today, as, as you said, just see everything happen. You go to church on Sunday, yes, but everything after that is normal, business, business as usual. So I'm imagining that uh, the Archbishop and are, is trying to reinforce uh, this notion that faith should be the focus on Sunday. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know that time of stores being closed on Sunday, uh, but this hey. is, I, no, 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 I, I just mean to say some of the uh, criticism uh, we've gotten has been about like, oh, you're just trying to go back to the end Griffith days or to leave it or leave it to Beaver or whatever. Do you really know is, what leave it to Beaver is? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard of it. <laughs> this is addressing the challenges of 2019. Right? This is about how do we respond as a church to the real particular needs and challenges we see here and now, and how can we help families and parishes and individuals, especially young people, address all of the, the demands they have all throughout the week, but then to say, God wants a part of your life, not just an hour, but he wants Sunday to be something different. And how do we make that look different here and now. And this is a first step in, uh, for us in Detroit to say, this is what we want to do to make Sunday look different. Have you had a lot of backlash about this? Families who say, hey, um, you know, you'll be overscheduled for the other six days or sports aren't a priority to you. Why not? Has there been any of that push and pull? Yeah, there has been. There's been some really kind of uh, good-natured uh, questioning, like, why why are we doing this? There's been some people who I think feel attacked because God, for them, is sports, right? That is their idol, their God. And so they feel like that's being attacked for them. And I think that's good for us to feel a pull uh, when we've taken something and put it on the throne of our heart, and that something is not someone, that's not God. I grew up playing soccer and basketball and baseball, I know the wonderful value sports has for instilling virtue, for helping young people grow in discipline, for teamwork, all of the great things. So this isn't an attack on athletics. This is just saying there's a better way we as a church can live our life and find how sports fits into that instead of dominating our whole life. Well, Father Stephen Pullis, wise words. Interesting, interesting uh, directive that's coming from the Detroit Archdiocese. Uh, you're with the Department of Evangelization and Catechesis and Schools. Uh, our producer is from Detroit, Rodney Harris. He, I'm sure he would yeah. say hello to you, right? <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thanks for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Let's keep in touch online. You can follow me at Lauren Ashburn on Twitter, Lauren Ashburn EWTN on Facebook. Good night and God bless you.